Today I'm making a very simple dinner. Something we eat about once a week is just steak and salad. But the devil's in the details when it comes to a good steak and a good salad. And I'm very finicky about my steak and my salad dressing. So let's get started with the steak first. Now here I have two beautiful steaks. These are New York strip steaks and they're good and thick. They're about an inch thick. Sometimes I like them a little thicker, but this is what the store had today. You can see it has nice marbling. And the trick is that two steaks easily serve three to four people. So we're gonna slice them before we serve them. And before you cook, you wanna salt the meat. You wanna let that salt hang out on the surface of the steak for at least 45 minutes, or you can do it up to a day ahead. If the longer you do it, the better it tastes. The salt does a couple things. It obviously seasons the meat, but it also changes the protein structure so that it holds on to moisture during cooking, so it tastes juicier. Now the amount of salt is key here. This is kosher salt. I'm gonna use a teaspoon of kosher salt for each steak, or that's half a teaspoon per side. Now obviously if using table salt, the amount would be about half the amount, it would be half a teaspoon because the crystal size is so different, so much smaller. All right, so we're gonna rub that salt into the steak. I know it looks like a lot of salt, but a lot of it comes off during cooking and a lot of it gets absorbed and these steaks taste really good. All right, on the second side. All right, we're gonna set these aside again for 45 minutes, up to a couple days. Obviously, if you're salting them for a day or two, you're gonna to wanna to put it in the fridge. But if you're just cooking it after 45 minutes, I think it's fine to leave it on the counter. Now I'm gonna give my hands a wash before making the salad. Now on to the salad dressing. Now, if you only learn how to make one salad dressing, make this the one because it goes with everything and I've never found a person who doesn't like it, including my finicky 12 year old. So, it starts with a little lemon zest. We're gonna get about two teaspoons of lemon zest. I use a microplane grater here and I'm just gonna get the yellow zest, not that white pith, that white pith underneath the zest, that tastes a bit bitter. You want about two teaspoons and obviously I've washed these lemons already. Mmm, all right, a little bit more. It's about two lemons worth of zest. All right, there we go. That's a perfect amount of zest. Now I'm gonna set those lemons aside because we're gonna add lemon juice in a little bit. Next, <laughs> magic ingredient. I know, it's a little odd. Mayonnaise. Now mayonnaise is an emulsifier, so it'll help the dressing have a nice consistency, a little bit on the thick side. Just a tablespoon will do it. Right in. Next ingredient, this is an unusual one. <laughs> you want molasses, not strong molasses, not a black strap, but a mild molasses. Adds some sweetness, adds a real deep caramelized flavor and some good color. And just a tablespoon of this, right into the shaker. All right, last but not least, we're gonna add a little Dijon, pretty classic for a vinaigrette. I'm gonna pull out a clean measuring spoon for the Dijon. All right, now just take a fork, whisk all that together. Get any lumps of Dijon or molasses out of the way. Next, we're gonna add some chives. And I like chives here because it's a mild onion flavor and the chives hold up for easily a week in the vinaigrette and this vinaigrette can last a good long time. So just gonna mince these finely. And you want about two teaspoons. I really like the chive flavor so sometimes I add a bit more. Into the hopper it goes. All right, next up, some lemon juice. They're gonna be easy to juice now that they've already been zested. You want about a quarter cup of lemon juice. When I first started making this vinaigrette, I really did measure everything, but now that I make it so often, I kind of have a sense of how much lemon juice is coming out of each lemon half. These are pretty juicy, so I think I only need three. I'm gonna put the lid on, shake it up. Now this is a pretty handy little salad dressing um, shaker. If you don't have that, you could simply use a jar with a tight fitting lid. All right. A few more ingredients. We're going to add some garlic. 
don't want to mash it too much. Now when I'm adding garlic to a sauce or a vinaigrette, I really like using the microplane zester because it gets the garlic really fine and incorporates evenly into the vinaigrette. This is a pretty big clove, so I'm not going to add all these little pieces. I think that's pretty good. You can scrape it out the back of it with a tip of a knife. Nice way to get all those nice pieces of puree right into the hopper. Next up, just a half a teaspoon of salt. It's kosher salt, so I added another little bit. Half a teaspoon of table salt. So you get used to that if you use kosher salt a lot like I do. I pretty much prefer it because I like how it tastes and I like how it feels, but you always got to add a little extra. All right, add that to the hopper. Give it a good shake. Looks like I'm making cocktails, doesn't it? All right, last but not least, we're gonna add the oil. I'm gonna add the oil in three different additions and I'm gonna use two types of oil. I'm gonna use olive oil and veg oil. Too much olive oil really overpowers the dressing, so we're gonna cut it with a little veg oil. So it's half a cup of olive oil and a quarter cup of vegetable oil. I'm gonna add them in three batches, about a quarter cup each. So that's a quarter cup of olive oil. And the reason why I'm adding it in batches is that it will really help emulsify into the dressing. And then again, this dressing will stay emulsified easily for up to a week. Quarter cup more oil. Second batch. Last but not least, the veg oil. Again, a quarter of a cup. And for veg oil, you can use canola, you can use veg oil. I really like using safflower oil, uh, the organic pressed safflower oil, because I think it has a nice clean flavor. All right. All right, a little taste. The only way to taste it is on your finger. Oh, such a simple dressing, really goes on everything from salads. Sometimes I toss it on uh, steamed cauliflower or fresh steamed green beans. And as I said, it keeps for up to a week in the fridge like that. All right, so the salad dressing's out of the way, the steaks are salting. Time to do a little prep for the salad itself. Here are the vegetables I'm gonna put on top of the lettuce. Uh, carrots, because those are my favorite. Cucumbers, because those are my husband's favorite. And apple, because that's my daughter's favorite. In fact, she very rarely will eat a salad unless it has apple in it. So, always an apple. I'm just gonna cut it into nice big hunks that you can stab with a fork. They have to be recognizable too, that's the other thing. Right into the salad bowl. Right next on to my favorite, the carrots. Uh, and I do the same for the cucumber. Um, I like leaving the peels of cucumber on. My daughter likes them coming off, so <laughs> they come off. All right, just gonna peel these cucumbers again right into the, <laughs> right into the garbage. I think we only need half a cucumber for today. Now for cutting cucumbers for salad, depending on who's making the salad, the seeds either get left in or taken out. If my husband's making the salad, the seeds get taken out. If I'm making the salad, the seeds get left in. I like the fiber. Again, nice big chunks that you can easily stab with a fork. Recognizable for the kids. Into the bowl. And for carrots, I like to slice them on the bias for the same reasons. Easy to stab with a fork, recognizable. And slicing on the bias just means that you get these nice elongated pieces. Mmm, that's a good carrot. All right. Carrots into the bowl. Last but not least, I'm gonna put the salad greens on top and then just set this aside until serving time when I can toss it with the vinaigrette and a little bit of feta. For these greens, I have some baby greens, um, a wide variety, green leaf, red leaf, and baby spinach. That looks good. All right, so steak salted, salad's pretty much done, just needs to be tossed to the last minute. Now we can get on to cooking. 
These steaks are ready to cook. And you can see they've changed color and they look a little glossy and tacky. That is a sign that the salt has worked its way into the meat, which is perfect. Now we're gonna to wanna to pat them dry really thoroughly before we cook them. Again, dry meat browns better than wet meat. And we haven't seasoned them with pepper yet either. So after I pat them dry, I'm gonna season them with a lot of pepper. I like a lot of pepper on steaks. And then we gotta do the second side, flip it over. Pat the second side. Now you notice I really didn't trim much of this fat on the side of the steak, and that is by design. Because sometimes I like to eat it if it tastes good and it has a nice sear on it, but also it's gonna add important lubrication for the cooking because we're not gonna add any oil to the pan. So here I have a 12 inch nonstick pan. Now this is a really unusual way to cook steak, but it works like a charm. And once you get the hang of the method, you don't even need to follow a recipe anymore. You just know to start in a cold skillet. That's right cold skillet, 12 inch nonstick pan. Put the steaks in the cold skillet about an inch apart. I'm gonna put this over high heat and we're gonna flip the steaks over every two minutes. And that just gets even cooking all the way through the steaks and even browning. And yes, the steaks will have a gorgeous sear on them by the end. Um, someone at work once explained the flipping of the steaks like old school sun tanning. You know when you're on the beach and you flip over every hour to get an even tan? Same thing for the steaks in the pan. So I'm gonna set the timer for two minutes and then we'll start flipping. Now we're about a minute in on these steaks. You can hear them start to sizzle and some of that fat is rendering. Again, that's gonna help the steaks brown. Now they're not gonna brown right away. It's gonna take a flip or two, but then you'll start to see them get a really beautiful crust. There's the timer, two minutes. Give it a little bit of a flip. All right. Timer for two more minutes and we're off. There it is, two minutes on that other side. You can see it's starting to get a really nice browning and we're not even done yet. All right, so back to the first side. Reset the timer, another two minutes. The total cooking time for the steak is a real variable. It depends on how hot your stove is, how thick your pan is, and how thick your steaks are. But it's usually between eight and 14 minutes all in. Also, I turned on the fan for obvious reasons. And you can see how it's really starting to steam and smoke. So I'm gonna turn the heat down now to more of a medium. All right, so these have been in the pan for about 12 minutes, again, flipping every two minutes. And I'm looking for a temperature in the very center, around 120 to 125 is a perfect medium rare. The carryover cooking on these steaks is significant. So carryover cooking is when you take the meat out of the pan, it's still really hot and the meat is still gonna cook through. And so because it, it, we're cooking on such a hot surface, there's a lot of carryover heat in the steak. So pulling it out around 115, 115 to 120 is perfect medium rare. Now that steak was a bit smaller than this steak. So let's see. Oh, perfect, perfect, all right. Okay, so we're gonna set these steaks aside, let them rest for five minutes at least. 10 minutes would even be better. When you let steak rest, what happens is the muscle fibers start to relax and they reabsorb all those juices. So you get a juice your steak, so don't skip the resting. So while those steaks rest, and of course the salad's ready to go at the last minute, I'm gonna make my all-time favorite sauce. It's more like a relish that uses parsley and I put this on everything, chicken, fish, shrimp, cauliflower, and, and I vary it quite a bit. Now, the one I'm making today is based on parsley, and it actually has a name. It's called persillade sauce. It's a classic French sauce. I've been misnaming it for years. I've been calling it persillade. I don't know why, but whatever you call it, it's fabulous. Uh, and it uses three quarters of a cup of parsley leaves, which is a lot. Now, I often sub out parsley for cilantro. It makes one of my favorites. Uh, sometimes with the cilantro, I've put in some mint or a little bit of tarragon, whatever fresh herbs you have really just makes a lovely relish. So we're gonna pick about 
three quarters of a cup of parsley leaves, which is a lot. And I don't want the thick stems in there, but any tender stems from the very end of the parsley is fine. And if I have a lot of parsley stems, I tend to save them in a bag in the freezer. They're great for when you throw together a big pot of broth, chicken broth or beef broth. They just add good flavor. So and I hate wasting things if I don't have to. So save the stems if you have a lot of them. Now, this sauce you can easily make by hand. I'm using a mini food chopper just because it takes a lot of the knife work out of it, even though I love knife work. All right, so that looks like about three quarters of a cup of parsley. Put all this back in the salad spinner. Obviously, I washed the parsley. Next, we're just going to add one scallion just for that little bit of oniony flavor, that allium-y flavor. But scallions taste so good raw. Now I'm gonna chop it a bit before I put it in the food processor just to make it a little easier on the processor blades. Now in cutting the white parts in half lengthwise is just something, is a habit of mine, just to make them all the smaller. Because those are the ones that tend to get stuck around the food processor blade. All right, into the food processor. Next up, we're gonna add some garlic, three cloves of garlic. You smash them like that to get the skins off. Plus, it's just a lot of fun. This is good garlic, good fresh garlic, so the skins are a little sticky. I like that. Well, that's the sign of the good fresh garlic. All right, I'm gonna give them a rough chop before I put them in the food processor. Now, this is where things really take an interesting turn. Next up, capers. This is a whopping quarter cup of capers. Make sure you rinse them because you don't want any of that salty brine. This adds what the unique flavor of persilad really is. Last but not least, some cornichons, which are basically little dill pickles. I like these ones. There's, there's little cocktail onions in there too. We'll add the cocktail onions to this sauce. The cocktail onions are delicious. What about six tablespoons, which is, you know, five or six cornichons. I like the cornichon flavor. And again, just gonna chop them up roughly before putting them in the processor. All right, here we go. On goes the lid. Just pulse it until it's a nice, fine, relish-like consistency. Halfway through, you gotta stop and scrape down the bowl. I'm really putting this thing to max volume here, so give it a little helping hand. All right, that is it. Oh, the smell of the cornerstones and the parsley. That is a good smell. Last but not least, we're going to add some olive oil. I add about half a cup. I make this so often, I don't really measure things anymore. I just do it till it looks good. So that's about half a cup of oil. Some salt and some pepper. Doesn't need much salt thanks to those cornerstones and the capers. Secret ingredient, a little cornichon juice, just a little bit of the brine from the jar, about a teaspoon or thereabouts. Oh, that was good. And also a pinch of sugar. I'm not big for adding sugar to savory recipes. I like to stay away from sugar as much as I can, but a pinch here really helps to bring out the parsley. So, oh yeah. Oh, that looks good. Add a little more oil. I like it to just have a little more of a sauce feeling, less of a relish feeling. And this will last in the fridge for a few days. And like I said, it tastes good on everything. And that's it for the sauce, the salad, and the steak. I'm just going to clean up, get some plates, and it's dinner time. Steaks are rested. I've poured myself a nice glass of wine. And it's time to slice in and see if I nailed the medium rare, which is very important to me. And obviously I'm using a carving board, which is a board with a moat around the edge that helps catch any of those juices, just prevents you from making a mess all over your countertop. And also those juices often wind up on the dog food. All right, let's take a look here. Always a little bit more well done on the ends. 
and the redness comes in a second or two after you cut it. That's what I'm looking for, medium rare right in the center of the steak. Obviously, it's a little more well done on the edges, but it's the center I care about. And if you're serving a crab, that's usually a good thing because some people like more well done meat and they can eat the ends while I will eat the very center. Ooh, perfect. Mm. There's one, let's check out the other one. Oh, these little nubbins on the end. Oh, that is a prime piece. That's a prime bite right there. Ian and I will fight over that later. Oh, this one's looking good. Oh, there it is. Nicely rested, perfect medium rare right in the middle. All right, so steak's cut. Time to dress the salad. Just giving the vinaigrette a little shake, although you can tell it's pretty well emulsified still. Oh, over the top. I like using my hands, but my wooden salad hands that I like to use, uh, they're ugly compared to the gorgeous wood of this bowl. So I don't like to pull them out and use them with this bowl. But it's, sometimes it's nice to use your hands because your hands are more delicate when it comes to tossing the delicate salad green. So, oh, there we go. Oh, that dressing smells good. That salad is perfectly dressed. Just gonna finish it with a couple crumbles of some nice fresh mild feta. Feta is great in salads because everybody likes feta, especially this nice, mild, creamy kind. Kind of melts into the dressing with, when you get to the end of your salad, changes the flavor a little bit. Perfect. Little goes a long way. Time to build the plates. Mm. Salad first. Oh, nice big portions of salad. Sometimes this is, eating salad like this is the only way we get our vegetables in in a day. Sometimes I like to put all the, the heavy vegetables and apples on the side, just so that it doesn't weigh down the salad grains. That's pretty good. All right, last but not least, some steak. One looks like the most salad. So this will be for me. Those nice center pieces <laughs> on my plate. Ian also likes the centerpieces, so I'll give him a lot more on the other plate. Here it goes. There we go. Miss Marta, she likes it a little more well done. She gets the end pieces. Just gonna add a lot of this sauce on top of my steak. I like as much sauce as I like steak, kind of equal portions. I've been known to eat this sauce straight out of the bowl before. Uh, some sauce for Ian. He likes the sauce, but not as much as I do, so he'll get a little less. And none for Miss Marta, because she's not a fan of the sauces yet. And that's it. A simple dinner made spectacular because we paid attention to the details. See you next time. <laughs> I don't know if I can eat this in front of him. Give me the evil eye. Thanks for watching. What'd you think? Leave a comment below and let me know what you're excited to cook this week. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. You can get today's recipes and more for free at our website, americastestkitchen.com slash Julia at home.